Lord with you today. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to come over to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4. And while you're making your way to Proverbs 4, we just want to wish everybody a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. And Memorial Day, you know, is the traditional start of the summer season. And this year, Memorial Day is the beginning of winter. <laughs> 42 degrees at my house yesterday morning. But we hope you have a great time with family and friends having some recreational time, doing whatever it is you're going to be doing. And we also hope that you're going to recall to mind what, what this holiday is really about. Take time to remember and take time to give thanks for the people who made the ultimate sacrifice for the life that we have, the political, the religious liberties that we enjoy in America. Let me tell you, church, look around at the world, and those liberties are rare, and we're blessed to have them. So let's be sure, with all the celebrating that we do and enjoying each other's company, let's be sure that we thank the Lord for that day and its true meaning. All right, have you got Proverbs 4? Let's begin reading in verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues or the streams of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. We've been sharing about how to be clean, how to be transformed by the Lord and get a fresh start in life. And as we continue looking at how to walk clean, I want to share with you this morning about some deadly spiritual dangers. Let's look together at some things that may sound old-fashioned to us but are still deadly, things that are still deadly. Let's pray and ask God's help as we look into his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your holy word. It's a light for our feet. It's a lamp for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we pray that our hearts would be good soil in this time, that we might receive and retain, and that would blossom out of us good fruit, Lord, from what you're about to say to us. Jesus said his words are spirit and life. So, Father, I ask that you would send the spirit right now and minister that life from Jesus to us, we ask in his name. Amen and amen. Well, are you feeling brave today? How many of you are feeling brave this morning? Are you feeling brave? Good. I have a kind of a frightening list that I'd like to read to you. And if you're brave enough to listen to it, it goes like this. Pride, greed, lust, wrath, gluttony, envy, and sloth. Scary just to read it, isn't it? It's quite a list, and if you're old enough, you may recognize that list as the seven deadly sins. This is not a list of sins we find in the Bible, although the Bible does have some lists of sins. The seven deadly sins is a list that Christian writers have been thinking about since the early centuries of the church. The reason why they're deadly is because they represent deadly attitudes of the heart, attitudes that produce destructive, deadly deeds. As Christian people, we're called by God to examine ourselves. When we come to Christ, he takes away our hard hearts of stone and he gives us soft hearts of flesh in their place. Aren't you glad about that? The Holy Spirit begins to make us sensitive to wrongdoing and we start to feel the sting when we displease the Lord. You know, there was a time when you probably didn't care if you stole, you didn't mind if you took some drugs, or gave people that special salute that you used to give them on I-95. <laughs> but now that you've come to Christ, your conscience now bothers you when you do those things, and now you know that it isn't right to do some things that you used to do. When you mess up, now you feel what we call the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And now when we ask the Spirit to examine our deeds, He will show us things that we need to confess and be made clean from. Thank God we know that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And thank God we've heard a lot of people testifying about how they came to Christ and then he started working on them. He started working on their hands and working on their tongues. He started giving them a divine makeover. Aren't you glad about that? I'm glad we can be forgiven for ungodly deeds. But I think to grow spiritually, we need to examine ourselves 
at a little deeper level. We need to learn to look at our hearts and look at the attitudes that actually give birth to ungodly deeds. So let's take a few moments together and be examined by the Holy Spirit. And if it helps you this morning, you can think of him as your heavenly cardiologist, if that helps you. So are you ready for a cardio exam this morning? I want to invite you to check out with me your heart. Let's check our hearts for signs of those seven deadly killers. And then we'll take a look at how we can guard our hearts and keep them pure. First on our list of deadly sins is pride. How many of you know about pride and understand all about pride? How many of you know what that is? None of you know what pride is? Pastor Glenn, we have found the humble service <laughs> among us. I was teasing everybody in the other services because they all raised their hands. And I said, well, you'd be too proud to admit that you didn't know what it was. We know what pride is. Pride is what made the Pharisee thank God that he was not like the other guy. Pride is what made the devil into the devil. Many call pride the root of all the other sins because it insists on promoting self, protecting self, and prospering self. The most misquoted verse in all the Bible is Proverbs 16, 18. And it says, pride goes before destruction, not a fall. Pride goes before destruction. Pride just won't make you fall and trip. It has the power to destroy lives. Pride is what tells me to look out for number one. And it's what makes us tell people, hey, it's my way or the highway. It's pride that compels us to get in the last word. And it's what ruins friendships because it keeps me from apologizing. Pride is the opposite of Jesus and his wonderful humility. Jesus said that he was lowly in heart. He served others and he washed their feet. Jesus was worshipped in heaven by legions of angels. He was served by creatures so majestic and beautiful that you and I might be tempted to worship them if we saw him. If anybody could insist on his privileges, it would certainly be Christ the King. And yet he very unselfishly gave all of that up so that we could enjoy the glory of heaven with him. Great people in the world never seem to mind telling us how great they are. When famous and rich people get arrested, we saw it a few weeks ago, what do they always say? Do you know who I am? But you know, the greatest person of all said, Father, I have come to do your will. The greatest one who ever walked the earth said, I am among you as someone who serves. May the Spirit search our hearts today. May we let him and see if our hearts are full of pride or whether there's really any true concern for others inside. Pride is still deadly because it makes a thousand poisonous plants grow out of the soil of our hearts. Next on my ugly list today is greed. I don't care what Gordon Gecko said in Wall Street, greed is not good. Greed leads us to ruin people's lives in a hundred sordid ways, cheating people, taking from people, enslaving people to debt, all for the sake of the profit margin. A few years back, there was a large nationwide survey that was done about private morality, very confidential, very anonymous. So it was designed to give us a true glimpse into what people are really thinking. You know that people lie to the poll takers, right? And this survey was released as a book called The Day America Told the Truth. I don't know if any of you remember that or heard of that book. The Day America Told the Truth. One of the questions that people were asked for that book was this. How far would you be willing to go for $10 million? What would you do for $10 million? Would you like to hear what people would do for $10 million bucks? 25% would abandon their entire family. 25% would abandon their church. Survey was obviously not taken here. 23% <laughs> would become prostitutes for a week or more. 16% would give up American citizenship, and 16% would also leave their spouses. 
10% would withhold testimony and allow a murderer to go free. Listen to this. For $10 million, 7% of Americans would kill a stranger. And 3% would give up their own kids for adoption to get $10 million. That's the power of greed. How many of you remember a few years back when Greenwich was getting turned into a, a, a circus sideshow because of Powerball? Remember that? Greed to get something for nothing. And the opposite of a greedy heart is one that's growing in generosity. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. It's good to be greedy if we're greedy for the riches that we can take with us when we leave this life. Greed isn't good. It's still deadly. God so loved the world that he gave. And if we do the same, we'll be able to unseat greed from the throne that it's been occupying in many hearts. Next on our hit list, as long as you're already cringing, Next on our hit list is lust. Lust is celebrated in our culture. Certainly sexual lust is. And like the other sins, lust is destructive in many different ways that I don't need to detail with you. Our Christian faith teaches us this. If you're engaging in sexual activity outside of the bond of marriage of one man, one woman that God designed for us, then you need to seek God for the grace of repentance and for the grace to have strength and overcome temptation. We've heard good teaching about that at Harvest Time, thank God. And we have courses, we have professional help, counselors here that can help you if you desire help. We've got people worshiping here, thank God, whom God has freed from many different things. Those stories can give hope to people who are looking for a way out of the prison of lust. It's something that's warping the lives of many people. We had a great testimony like that just last week, in fact. I want to tell you, church, there's hope for you. There's hope for freedom today. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul went through a recitation of some sins, sexual sins and otherwise, that had once plagued the people of God. And then he gave us hope by saying, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified and justified. In other words, there's hope. You don't have to stay being and doing what you are. There's a way out. There's hope for you for change through Jesus Christ. But let me say that theologically, you know, lust is about much more than just inappropriate sexual desire. What the Bible calls the lust of the flesh is about much more than sex. It's about any excessive impulse in the direction of comforts and pleasure might interest you to know the Latin word for lust is luxuria. That's where we get our English word luxury. So, you know, if you're into drugs and partying or if you are someone who always has to have the very best of everything, the very best of comforts, then you're also giving vent to lust in your life. So the world says, if it feels good, oh, you know that one. <laughs> hmm. But you know, lust isn't really a joking matter or an old-fashioned idea. It's still very deadly. And as Christians, we need God's help. We need to seek the Holy Spirit for his wonderful fruit of self-control. The fourth item on our list is wrath. Wrath. Some of you have that kid, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Wrath is ungodly anger, anger that is not righteous, that is not justifiable in the circumstances. And church, let me say that few sins do more damage than out of control anger. Proverbs 29, 22 says, a furious man abounds in transgression. In other words, if you're a hot-tempered person, sin and sorrow will be plentiful in your life, and it will be unavoidable because of that. There is so much rage in our day, so much rage that seems unnatural now in society. And it wasn't always like that. I find this to be a very frightening change in our society. Don't beep the horn because who knows what's going to happen. You know, 
People got fired in the old days too, but we don't read about workplace violence in the history books, you know? Hezekiah hath been laid off, and lo, he goeth postal. <laughs> we didn't hear about those kinds of rages back then. Where, where does it come from? I think a lot of it comes from unforgiveness. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness and resentment, and from there we know it often can swell to hatred and even to outright physical violence. Anger spirals into levels and into words and actions that we never thought it would spiral into. And the consequences are disastrous. In Proverbs 22, we have this good advice from the Lord. Do not make a friendship with an angry man and don't associate with hot-tempered people. That's very good advice. Don't whitewash it either by saying, well, you know, it's because I'm, I'm hot-blooded. You know, I'm a hot-blooded German or Puerto Rican or Italian. That's not an excuse. Let the Holy Ghost help you. Out of control anger isn't harmless. It's deadly. And sometimes it's literally deadly. How are we doing? Is this okay? All right. Let's take a breath then before we move on to the next one. In fact, actually, don't take a breath. You may want to actually loosen your belt for this one. Because next on our list is gluttony. Forty years ago, we had this TV commercial, you may remember, it said, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Well, it's 2013, and 40 years have gone by, and we're still eating the whole thing. Only the problem is our bowl is twice as big. The government keeps track of this, you know, and numbers don't lie. Now, I was born way back in 1962, Brother Amel, when men still wore hats. And back in 1962, the rate of obesity was 13%. Now, it's 36% almost triple the rate of obesity. And speaking of 1962, Pastor Glenn, did you know that 1962 is the approximate calorie count of the classic Monte Cristo sandwich at the Cheesecake Factory? <laughs> that may explain quite a bit. Wherever we go, portions are bigger, and that means people are getting bigger too. But can I say that just because this is a very common sin and one that we like to chuckle about, that doesn't make it less sinful. Indulging excessive appetites in food and in drink is a sin against the wonderful temples, the bodies that God has given us to serve him and others. We owe it to ourselves, and we owe it to people who are depending upon us to do better in this area. Here, as in other areas of life, we need the Holy Spirit's help. We need his self-control. Feasting is fun, and food sure does taste good, but gluttony is still deadly. The next poison that we need the heavenly cardiologist to check us for is envy. And envy is very different because people can joke and even boast about all the other ones. But envy is the one sin on this list that no one will admit to. Precisely because it makes us look so petty. In that pettiness we resent people who have more and are doing better than what we are doing and we covet what they have. What matters is not what we have, what matters is what we've got in comparison to the other guy. I heard about a very amazing study showed that we would rather make 50,000 when others are making 25 than make 100,000 when others are making 200. Think about that, did you get that? We would rather make 50 when others are making 25 than make 100 when others are making 200. Envy makes you irrational. And envy, may I say, is also blind. Envy is very good at seeing and spotting the blessings that other people have, but it's incapable of seeing the blessings that God has given us. Early warning signs of the sickness of envy include grumbling, murmuring, and complaining. And Thomas Aquinas, the theologian, gave us another warning sign. He said envy is sadness at the good that other people are experiencing. Wow. The Bible counsels us to be content with the things that we do have. It says because we know we are connected to the one who said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. We can defeat envy if we are content with Christ and what Christ has given us graciously from his hands. Envy is not just harmless fantasizing about a better life. It's deadly, and it can lead to theft and to betrayal. 
last on this sad list, what a relief, is the sin of sloth. Sloth. <laughs> Sloth is another sin, as you can see, that we seem to have perfected. We are the country, after all, that invented the Barca lounger. And I don't think moms still are telling their kids that idle hands are the devil's helpers. Not us. We've got the t-shirt that says, hard work never killed anybody, but why take a chance? Sloth in the English language usually means laziness, and laziness is a terrible danger to us. The Bible says that some people, get this, I don't know if you've ever read this proverb, but the Bible says that some people are so lazy that they are too lazy to even bring their food up to their mouth. That's pretty lazy. When, when I found out about that, Marianne, I decided to switch over to sloth for a few weeks so I could lose some weight. But theologically, listen, sloth is about more than being lazy. Sloth means that you lack, theologically now, sloth means that you lack energy for spiritual things. It means that you cannot be bothered to rouse yourself to try to make any spiritual progress. And the laziness we have in the body is only a manifestation of that. You're not a pursuer of God's presence. So you see, this is very different from the other sins on the list. Those are about being excessive. This is about being deficient. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with resting. The Sabbath was God's idea, after all. And yes, you do need a break today, but sloth is still deadly. Church, a time does come when we have sat enough. And it's time to get up and to do and to strike and strike hard. Let's imitate Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, how is it that you did not know that I must be about my father's business? Let's go to God for fresh vision and get a fresh desire in our spirits to attempt and do great things for God. Paul says in Romans 13, it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Wake up and get going and get doing. That's quite a list, seven deadly sins. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So, folks, I want to encourage you today to no longer just catch yourself when you fall into a sin. It's good that we can spot that. But let's examine our hearts and see what brought us into that action in the first place. Think about sin. So let's start to think about sin and grace at a deeper level. Let's understand our hearts and start to think about, at a deeper level, what really makes us tick. See, the world says, oh, it's the environment. That's your problem. You need to be raised in a better environment. And if you can eliminate poverty and so forth, then, then you can perfect humankind. Other people say that the problem with the human race is a lack of willpower and training. We've got to make better choices, and we've got to improve ourselves. Some say man's problem is ignorance, and so what we need is education. But I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, all that education does is it just makes man a more clever devil. And wow, I was right. But Jesus called out the true problem of the human race. Jesus gave a diagnosis, and ever since he did, philosophers and religious-minded people have hated his diagnosis. Jesus said this in Mark 7, and you thought my list was bad. That which comes out of the man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So then, what do we need? Our great need is not to be raised in a better environment or to be better educated. No, what Jesus is telling us is that our need is a new heart. In verse 23 of Proverbs 4, Solomon said, Keep your heart, guard it with all diligence, because out of it spring the issues of life. The Bible compares your heart here, your inner man, 
to springs of water. And he's telling us that if the springs inside you are defiled, then of course what is getting released out of those springs is going to be unfit to drink. And it's going to pollute our lives and it's going to pollute our friends and families and communities. Our great need is a clean heart. A heart that is releasing fresh living water out into our surroundings instead instead of a poisonous evil stream that nobody would ever want to drink in their right mind. You know, there's a wonderful picture of this in the story of the Exodus. When Moses brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, they were just beginning their trek in the wilderness. They had just crossed the Red Sea, and the first story we read after they come across is this in Exodus 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now they came to Marah, where they couldn't drink the waters of Marah, because they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. That just means bitter in Hebrew. The people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it, when he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. You know, in just the same way, Jesus wants to bring us out of slavery. We're on our way to freedom, but our problem is we have a little issue with our water supply. Our springs of water are no good. Like Israel, you may find yourself today in the wilderness of Shur. You know what Shur means? The word Shur means a wall. You've hit a wall. You're stuck in life, and the water's no good. What's the answer? Well, the solution for them was a tree. God showed Moses a tree, and the answer was to cast that tree into those bitter waters. Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus also has a tree? When Moses cast that tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And I want to tell you this morning that when the cross of Jesus Christ, his tree, is introduced to your waters, your waters will also change from bitter to sweet. Somebody praise the Lord. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence because out of it are the streams of life. Once the Lord makes our hearts pure, it's our duty to keep a pure heart. Keeping it there means keep in the sense of guarding it against outside danger. In Hebrew, it's very strong. In Hebrew, it means above and beyond anything else that you guard, guard it. That's powerful. Make sure, in other words, that you are guarding the purity of the spring of clean water that God has now put into your heart. It's not that by your actions you're making it pure. He's done that for you. Our job is to guard that spring. The streams of life come out from there, so keep them clean with his help. How can we do that? In our text, I see four things that Solomon says to watch out for, and I want to give them to you really fast. The first way we need to guard our hearts is this. Solomon says, check your counsel. Check your counsel. Verse 20 says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline, means lean, right? Incline your ear to my sayings. Listen in and listen up. Holy Spirit's question to you today. Who is counseling you? What kind of advice are we listening to today? Are you reading God's word? God's telling us there to lean in and listen closely to him. Because if we do, it will keep our hearts pure. Young people, are there any elders in your life? Are there any wise elders in your life? Do you ask any counsel or advice from mom and dad? Or are you still at that stage of life where you're convinced that mom and dad don't know anything? We older people, this is on us too. We need to ask ourselves, am I one of those people that has to be broke or bleeding before I'll ask advice from somebody? See, earlier in chapter 4, Solomon said this. He said, wisdom is the main thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. He says, so therefore, with all of the getting, with all of the acquiring that you do in life, make sure that you acquire wisdom. Read the word of God and you'll be wise. It will be the making of you. And then you can know that what flows out of your heart will be clean and fresh. Second thing we need to do to guard our hearts is check our company. Check our company. This is good preaching right here. Verse 24 says, put away from you a deceitful mouth 
and put perverse or worthless lips far away from you. If you want to stay pure, if you want the springs of your heart to stay pure, look at the company you keep. We have a saying that a man is known by the company he keeps. All my Spanish friends, you know I'm Spanish by marriage, Spanish friends, it says, tell me who you're running with and I'll tell you who you are, right? Now, those are wise sayings, but the truth is we're not only known, hear me, we're not only known by the company we keep, we are shaped by the company we keep. The Bible says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Don't be deceived, it says. Solomon says here, put a worthless mouth far away from you. That doesn't mean cleaning up our own speech, although we may need to do that. But what it means in context is we need to put away from our lives the people who have worthless mouths. Put their mouths far away from you. Do not take as your close friend or associate someone who has a wicked, worthless mouth. That applies to more than just what we call swear words. It means things that are unprofitable. Remember what Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth is the overflow of the heart. That means that people who say things that are inappropriate, that are unwholesome, or that are just plain not edifying and no good have been thinking about those things and pondering them in their hearts. Otherwise, it wouldn't be coming out. You need to be careful about how you associate with people whose mouths are worthless. The third thing I need to do to keep my heart healthy and keep the wellsprings of my heart pure is check what's coming in the gates. Check what's coming in the gates. Pastor, I've got to go home after this part and see how many people have unfriended me. <laughs> check what's coming in. Verse 25 says, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Men and women alike, hear me this morning. Let's be careful where our eyes are looking. If there are things around us that we shouldn't be looking at, then let our eyes be fixed straight ahead and let's walk straight ahead without distraction. Church, if we're going to make sure that those springs that Jesus cleansed don't get defiled again, then we need to be serious about what comes in the gate of the eye and the gate of the ear. Now, I know that's a very old-fashioned notion because when we say things like that, it makes you think of your blue-haired Sunday school teacher back in 1964 singing, be careful little eyes what you see and all that. And yet, let me tell you, very seriously, we are in the midst of a great struggle for the minds of our kids and for the minds of our teens and adults. Every day, people are taking in images and listening to music that inflames their passions and drives them to lust, drives them to violence, and drives them down into depression. I mean, how is it edifying to listen to a song that says, I can't live if living is without you? <laughs> That's cheery. Listen, King David made a very powerful and very helpful vow before the Lord. And he said, I will set no wicked thing. Literally in Hebrew, it says no thing of the devil. I will place no thing of the devil in front of my eyes, he said. And David did not even have, as far as I know, cable television. Well, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I couldn't help seeing it. It was all over the place. Well, forgive me, but maybe what should not have been in that place was you. This is, this, it's true, this is the kinds of things people say. Well, you know, Pastor Nick, I have problems with lust every time I go to that bar. <laughs> your eye is a window that lets others see what's in your soul. But your eye is, first of all, the window that lets everything else into your soul. So sometimes we need to pull the window shades down. I don't know about you, but if you're like me, your eyeballs came with the eyelids included at no extra cost. <laughs> so some of us need to be using our eyelids a little bit more frequently than we have been. Grandma was right. 
You cannot look at pornography and avoid becoming inflamed with lust in your mind and in your body. There's no way around it. The Bible says, can a man take fire into his bosom, into his shirt, and not get burned by it? No. And let me also say, while I'm at it, <laughs> you cannot listen to vile music and degrading talk about the opposite sex and have it not affect your attitude towards the opposite sex. It's rampant. Men are like this. Men are like that. Women are like this. Women are like that. And when was the last time you saw a TV commercial where the husband was not a complete dope? blowing up the barbecue or all kinds of things. All those things are not honorable. It's old-fashioned advice, but it's still good. Be careful what you look at and what you listen to. And finally, Solomon says, check your course. Check the course you're on. Verse 26, ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or left. Remove your foot from evil. Question from the Holy Spirit today. Where are you going? Where are you headed? Ponder the path of your feet. What are your ways? And to the Hebrew mind, that meant what are your habits of life? What are you doing with your leisure and entertainment time? Is your pathway, Solomon wonders, is your pathway established? In other words, is this a safe road for you to walk on? Or is there something on that roadway that's going to cause you to slip and get hurt? Now that you've come to know Jesus, there may be some paths that you can't walk in anymore. Look at the road that you're on and see where it ends. The Bible says that there is a road that looks great to us, but the end destination is destruction. Think about this. If everyone in your family was an alcoholic, what makes you think that you can start drinking socially and not be affected by it? Ponder the path of your feet. There's so much wisdom here from Solomon in Proverbs 4. Check your counsel. Check your company, check what's coming in, and check your course in life. And that's solid wisdom that we can use to guard the castle of our hearts and to keep the springs of water pure that are within us. Pastor Jason and the team, you can come back if you would. Beloved, this has been kind of a strong word, but I trust that it's been profitable for us. You know, sometimes we got to get some good medicine from the great physician. Amen? Amen? Jesus wants our good and he wants our peace. So I think it's possible to live a life that's not only blessed, but a life that's truly a blessing to those that are around us. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the streams of life within you are not polluted, but are life-giving streams. Think about it this way. Everyone that you come in contact with is a walking spring, a spring of water releasing the essence of who and what they've made themselves to be out into their environment. That's a deep thought. As you flip your hamburger this afternoon, think about that. So Solomon says, this is important. Guard your heart. Give all your diligence to guarding your heart, and you'll be successful at keeping the springs of water inside you pure. So as we close today, church, I want to encourage you again to think about sin differently and deeper. Notice, notice not only the deeds that you do, but the attitudes that have produced them and caused them to flow out of your life. Look a little deeper at your heart. Examine your own lips and check and recognize that because your mouth is the overflow of the heart, your mouth is the best indicator of spiritual heart trouble. A list like the seven deadly sins is really just a tool that we can use to understand ourselves and understand our, our own motivations better before we have a true problem. Am I prideful? Am I envious? Or maybe am I a little bit slothful? If we search God, God will be, uh, seek God for it, God will be faithful to search us and he will show us where it is that we're starting to fall short of the beautiful character of Jesus. So much better to live life the way that Jesus says we can live it and the invitation to a type of life that he offers us. Remember that story of Moses that we read before. When my heart was just a pool of bitter waters, Jesus gave me his tree. He gave me his cross to make those waters of my heart sweet. 
Now he's offering us a life of beauty that's filled with the joy of his spirit. Remember how Jesus said, and maybe now it'll make more sense to all of us. Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit, and he said, He that believes in me, out of his innermost being will flow, what? Rivers of living water. That living water is spring water. It's water that has life, and it's water that can give life to its surroundings. It's water that can make a desert blossom. So church, let's be diligent. Let's guard our hearts so that we can continually enjoy a life with him that's fresh and pure and clean. Amen. Come on, let's stand together and let's give Jesus some praise. Come on, if he's touched you, if he's made your life good and clean and fresh, oh, thank you, Jesus. Come on and bless him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, we need to pray before we go. We need to pray into this for just a few moments, and we need to invite the Holy Spirit's work to come and show us where Jesus might need to clean us up just a little bit. Come on, would you lift your hands with me? Turn your face toward heaven. We're going to sing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The way to get started, the way to have the pool of waters within you change from bitter to sweet. It's through that tree. It's through the work of Jesus Christ touching your heart and making you new. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want to invite you, if you don't know God in a personal way through Jesus today, I want to invite you to come to him today in sincerity. Lay aside your way of life that's really not doing you any good anyway. That's what repentance is. Let's take opportunity right now. Let's all pray together and invite Jesus to be our Lord and our shepherd and our king. And I want to encourage you, if you've never prayed to make Jesus the Lord of your life, Pray along with us as we pray out loud. Say, Dear Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I need your forgiveness. I need your abundant life. Jesus, I confess you as Lord. I turn from my own ways. I believe that God raised you from the dead to set me free. Forgive my sins. Be my Savior and my King. Fill me with your Spirit and give me the fresh start that I need. Amen. Come on, give him a hand of praise and thank him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. If you pray that way today for the first time, then right after we conclude in prayer in a moment, I want to invite you to come. There'll be some friends here to help you, to greet you, and we want to give you some materials, put some things in your hand that will get you started in a new life of walking with Jesus and knowing him in a personal way. Let's take one more moment to pray together. Let's invite all of us, whether you've been serving the Lord for six days or 60 years, let's reach out our hands to the Lord and let's invite the Holy Spirit to work and cleanse us. Lord, would you search our hearts today, Lord God. Father, if any of these things have taken root in us, Lord, pride and greed, Lord, lust, wrath, gluttony, envy, sloth, Lord, we turn away from these things, Father. Lord, these things may sound old-fashioned to the word, Lord, but to the world, but we know that they're still deadly to us. We say, come Holy Spirit, show me in my heart anything that I may need to confess and get rid of. Maybe we've run with a bad crowd. We've made bad choices. Maybe we've been listening to foolish advice. We pray like David today. We say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Come on, say that. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Holy Spirit, would you come and fill the people of God? Jesus said when the Spirit came, he was going to give us strength for service and power for daily life. He said, he that believes in me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Come on, lift both your hands. Lift your face to heaven before we go and pray for the Holy Spirit to come and fill you afresh with his life and power. Come on, lift it up to him. Fill me, Spirit of the Lord. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Come on, invite those rivers of living water. Flow, 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 rivers of living water.